The title of my presentation is Reading the Infant in the NICU. And that, especially after hearing Mandy, that's really what's so very important, to understand each baby and understand how that baby manages the environment and care we bring, as we have to do in our setting, no financial conflict of interest. I have a conceptual conflict of interest. I'm part of the board of the NFI, and I'm a NETCAP and APIP master trainer. My own team in Boston, or I'm part of this team, thank Duffy for our neurological work, Gloria McAnulty and Samantha Butler from Psychiatry Psychology. Is it good? Can you hear me? And our big facilitator, Sandra Costa. And then in terms of some of the MRI studies I'll show, Simon Warfield has been our steadfast collaborator. It takes a team to do the work we do, just as it takes a team in the unit. My first visit was in 1979, and I had the good fortune to meet John Lind. John Lind, as my own mentor, Barry Brazelton, understood the competence of the newborn. He understood and advocated to understand the healthy baby as open and receptive at all times. And what took me to talk with him was my feeling and experience that the mother's intrauterine development, her own intrauterine experience and emotion influences the fetus just as the extrauterine environment influences the child. Jan Lindbergh had invited me, and that also allowed me to see your unit at the time. Hugo, Professor Lagerkrantz, was a young intern. No, he was a young attending, forgive me. And I was a young psychologist, but Hugo sort of knew what I was looking at. And after we visited the unit, he said, well, what do you think of our unit? And he had all these interns and residents around him. And I wasn't sure, should I be diplomatic? Should I be honest? I usually can't help but being honest. So I said, well, you have a lot of opportunities to understand the baby better. So it took a few years, and then Björn Westrup and Anjeta Klever came to Boston. And with them intermittently came Karen, who was particularly interested in the APEP, the APIB. I must admit, I put them through their steps. <laughs> and at 6.30 in the evening, they said, you know, we are used to stopping and to having a break and to go for a walk. It's very important. So I learned a lot from my students. <laughs> I, I kept the pressure up, I must admit. So they formed their team and it consisted, in addition to the Karolinska group, also of the Lund group. Niels, Niels Svenningsen was the professor and the mentor for Karin Sternquist. And Lena would come to some of our get-togethers, and she would help us understand what happened with the EEGs. Now, as you know, we are to our next generation with Stina Clemming, who is being trained by Anjeta and by Deborah Bühler. So as Björn just said, 1999, they established the Scandinavian Midcap Center, which included Stockholm and Lund. And then within a year, they were brave enough to host the trainers meeting up in Talberg. 
And that was quite the meeting. People still speak about it because we were Vikings. We had horns and hats and all sorts of Viking exercises. <laughs> Bjorn is getting embarrassed. To balance our Viking experiences, we were invited to go on to Lund, where was a big symposium for opening the center of us. So I learned about the richness of Scandinavian life. Now, why newborn individualized developmental care? We all know that prematurity is increasing. I'm a psychologist, and what's for me the biggest challenge is how do we support and perhaps prevent the later disabilities that preterm infants experience as they grow older. And I look at these disabilities, and I really should say differences, as neuroregulation differences. They all have to do with how the brain processes and modulates itself in taking in and producing out. Mandy showed us what that means for the later life and what that means for the quality of the child and family's life when we unwittingly misunderstand the baby. Petra Hüppi showed us in the slide 24, we saw a 23-week baby yesterday in the unit who survived, who is surviving. The brain is very smooth. You look at 40 weeks, and Professor Lagerkranz already spoke about the importance of the frontal lobe that's proportionately enlarged, and that I consider our human species-specific survival part of the brain. We need a good frontal lobe. We need to be able to plan and predict outcome without going through trial and error. We need to be able to see the bigger picture while focusing on the detail. And we need to be able to regulate our emotion up to be engaged enough, but also down to bring it all back together. The frontal lobe, interestingly, gets no primary sensory input. That all comes from the other parts of the brain visual cortex, somatosensory cortex, auditory cortex. And that frontal lobe gets all that and has to make sense of it, attempts to make sense of it. So if you have the good fortune to come a term, you've had nine months or so of the supporting, modulating mother's intrauterine environment. You've had all that that entails. You've had her hormonal regulation and her affective inputs if we haven't pressured the mother too, too much. So we have a responsibility to support the mother to be able to support the fetus. And then you have the mother's skin and her body and all that that entails and her breast to suckle and gradually you reach out and you become a member of the bigger social group, always able to return, as we all do through our lifespan, as long as our mothers and parents live. They call us, are you doing okay? Are you getting enough sleep? <laughs> what are you all up to? Totally different for the baby in the NICU. All that support, all that protection, as Mandy so poignantly pointed out to us, is gone, it's missing. The baby is isolated in an incubator. And you have seen these views, and we unfortunately still see them in many units, in many countries. So the preterm infant is a fetus outside of the womb. Think about that each time you come to your unit. 
Think about all these little brains that are attempting to put themselves together, to grow themselves. How do we do that? We can always observe the behavior of the baby. It's a continuous expression of that little brain's function. We don't need instruments. The only instrument we need is our own effort to learn the language of the baby, our intention to understand the baby, to see behavior as meaningful, all behavior. And then we can use what the baby says to guide us in how we approach, how we care, how we support the parent to take over from the womb the care of their infant. We formulated the synactive theory of development, which many of you, I'm sure, are familiar. This allows us to organize studying the language of the baby so that we always see these various subsystems in mutual interplay with one another. Nothing happens in one system without having in spillover, having maybe large cost to the other systems. And as they want to re-regulate themselves and modulate themselves, one system moves to support the other if we give it half a chance. The baby is always in an environment, from the womb into the nursery, and from the nursery out into the home environment. So all of us are always in an environment, and the environment we are in takes different costs for each of us. So we get to know understand our, and understand ourselves better if we think in this model. Where are my thresholds to smell, to sound, to bright lights, as I'm confronted with one? And how do we integrate it and control and contain ourselves so we are available and can attune to understanding the language of the baby. So the importance is what often we find, people find difficult, to see this continuous interplay. How is the breathing affected? How is the color affected? What is happening to the digestive tract? Is this baby hiccuping? We approached a baby yesterday in the unit and we tried to help the baby contain, and the baby opened his eyes and he looked up, but now he was trying to breathe and swallow and look, and it brought him into big hiccups. So our well-intended approach threw him over the edge, and here he went into hiccups, which was very costly for him. So to time and to tighter, your inputs will allow you to prevent a lot of the cost for the baby. In the motor system, we can watch the tone, well-toned face, already flaccid body. So what do you want to do? You want to first help that baby gain that tone back before you do anything else. Extend some movements, postures of arching, and postures of overflexing. You've all seen it. And the topic of this conference, regulation of states and regulation of sleep. We look at the range of states based on the Brazelton six states. So we look from sleep, deep sleep, light sleep, drowsy transition to becoming awake. And from awake, maybe, moving up to arousal and to real crying and upset. Within each of these states, we differentiate by behavioral observation, robustness of the state, which we then call B, or diffusion, diffuseness, strainedness of the same state, and at the transition patterns. This is a baby who goes from sleep to arousal very quickly, this is a baby who just stays protecting him or herself in, slow sta in low states, 
or is this a baby who is always upset? So if you look here, sleep, sorry. That's where I am. Sleep, deep sleep, state one, be it A or B, this baby is clearly asleep. From a still, you can't say whether it's state one or state two. From there, the baby goes through drowsiness. I don't have a good picture of that. It comes to alertness. This baby is clearly interested. The eyes are a little glassy. It's sort of low, keyed, somewhat protective. Uh, alertness, so we call it 4A, diffuse L, low. Compared to this panic-looking baby who is awake, alert, hyper-alert, to the babies who get aroused and screaming or crying at high cost to them. Now, the NICU is your prime sleep deprivation laboratory. Preemies, babies, first go into light sleep. And from light sleep, they go into deep sleep, if they are fortunate enough to get there, from where they go back into a light sleep and a deep sleep cycle. In NICUs, the light sleep typically gets interrupted over and over and over again and the deep sleep period never gets achieved. So we are surprised that we send babies home with sleep deprivation syndrome, but we've really caused it. And then uh, the NICU factors, we give in many units care by the clock. Around nine, these and these and these babies get fed, they get cared for. Now, this baby may be just trying to make it into deep sleep. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to postpone that feeding? Will your next shift person say you didn't do your work? You are leaving this baby for me to feed. So you know what happens. We interestingly put these fetal babies quickly into a horizontal position. And if the baby is lucky enough to get fed upright, how quickly does he go back into the incubator horizontally? That's an alien position for a fetal baby. The incubators all have motor sounds. And we have such loud environments. I want to show you some EEGs from our studies where we really wanted to get light sleep and deep sleep. These babies were in individual rooms, protected, we thought. And we often couldn't quite hear what the triggering sound was. In the next room, a monitor goes. So this baby in the study wakes up and stays awake for quite a while and builds up and finally goes back to sleep. The janitor buffers the floor out in the hallway. You are in your own private room, so what are you worried about? The baby is worried. The baby... to learn to respect this mouse. The baby again, awakens immediately and stays awake for some good 15 seconds. Then, with big protection, tries to go back to sleep. Some of these study babies, we literally could only get deep sleep with the mother holding the baby, which we then learned that was really the ideal way to do it. The baby keeps trying to regulate him or herself. He makes hundreds and thousands of efforts. He crawls down to the end of the incubator. He protects his eyes, he protects his ears, and he tries to get away from all the disturbance. We often don't see these strategies. We ignore them, and then we prevent him 
from having success experiences. So the system tries to always reorganize itself, remodulate itself in order to be able to open up to take the next step. The model then within these observations became the parent is the best echo niche for the baby. If the baby can't be inside, then we can have the baby on the parent outside. And uh, the family system is the unit of support for this infant. So NICUs have this unique opportunity to do their specialized intensive care that the baby needs in order to survive in this ecosystem of the parents and the family. That's easier said than done, and often we make steps back, and now our unit is bright again, and now our unit is loud again, and now we don't have doors to support the room to be really a private room, and so it goes. The parents' hands want to and are good at supporting the baby. The parent takes all the time it takes to hold the reservoir and lower it for the feed and the baby can't quite take in more at the time. The parent doesn't watch the clock how long it takes unless you train the parent that she's now this and this old and she should be feeding faster. The best bed for the baby is the parent's chest. That's where the baby is assured of warmth and the smell of the mother and or the dad and has this assuring intimacy. Feeding from kangaroo care, from skin to skin care, to nuzzling on the breast without feeding, just playing and then eventually suckling and effectively take the food in. That allows us to safeguard a quiet, soothing environment for the infant and the family to grow in security and trust. Linda Gilkerson, a dear colleague of mine, told us, like any child, the preterm infant counts on protection, predictability, restfulness, intimate contact, and pleasure and contentment. These are big words in units. We don't chart the amount of time a baby experiences these feelings in 24 hours, let alone in the many months in the unit. So NITCAP, individualized, developmentally supportive, newborn behavior and strengths-based, infant and family integrated and relationship-based, staff supportive, and as already was mentioned, reflection in action based. And we have evidence, and I'll show you some of that. And for units, it requires a paradigm shift. It requires the will of everyone involved to change the system we used to be, we used to be used to. So evidence based, there are now 15 NITCAP studies in the literature. 10 of which are randomized controlled trials. Bjorn mentioned their own trial here, and uh, there are other trials in Edmonton, and uh, at the, there was a trial done in st at Stanford, and, uh, and we have done a number of studies. The asterisk items, length of hospital stay, age of discharge, better neurobehavioral and EEG and MRI function were acknowledged in the meta-analysis by Olson and Jacobs. I want to focus in showing you some of the results of our studies, mainly on the neurocognitive outcomes rather than also the medical outcomes, although they are, of course, interrelated. We studied a group of under 29 week babies born at under 29 weeks who were quite ill who had to be ventilated and breathed for for the first 24 hours and the first 48 hours as minimum. And we studied them out to age eight. What did we find? With the APIB, the assessment of preterm infant's behavior that measures autonomic, 
motor function, state organization, and the attentional system, and the self-regulation to bring these systems back into balance, and then the amount of facilitation it takes from the outside measures those subsystem functions on nine-point rating scales. The higher the score, the most easily disorganized. The lower the score, the, most, the more stable and more modulated. So what you see, this is done at two weeks after expected due date. The experimental group, the NITCAP group children, are typically more well-regulated in terms of autonomic function, in terms of motor function, significantly better in terms of state organization. And what I'm always most interested in, in self-regulation, how to bring themselves back together when they have become disorganized. And th they take a fair amount of regulation, even still at two weeks after due date. The MDIs, Bailey scale, mental developmental index scores, 100 is the mean of this test, 15 is the standard deviation. They are significantly better in MDI, as well as in PDI, the psychomotor developmental index. In terms of EEG, neurophysiological function, this is coherence analysis with Frank Duffy's work. We have found that out at age eight, the frontal lobe is much more well connected as far back in the brain as the occipital lobe. That's been like we couldn't believe it, that it lasted into that late, late, relatively late school age time when the environments of these babies have been whatever the home environments and school environments are. Families from another study experience much less stress on the, on the parental stress index in terms of the infant, the lower the score, the better now. In terms of parents stressed as parents, in terms of their confidence and adequacy, and in terms of total stress. They also experience their lives as less stressful, although at baseline they had all comparable scores in all of these parameters. We studied then a group of well-grown, low-risk babies who don't ever get to be, don't have to be on the ventilator, who don't have any of the vasopressors and these other medications, and said, does it still matter for them? And this study is based on a study that Deborah Bühler did before this with a group of well-developed uh, preterms born between 29 and 33 weeks and followed them again from the newborn period to age eight behavior, EEG and MRI-wise this time. Again, in terms of the APIB, it matters how you care for these healthy feeder growers, as they are called in the US. Their motor systems are much more well organized and their self-regulation is more competent. That carries forward do I have the daily data? I don't. Maybe I do. But here is the EEG uh, information first at two weeks after due date. You already have learned to look at what is the frontal lobe doing, how well is it playing with the other lobes, does it go across the hemispheres, how far back does it reach in regulation and organization of brain activity. And you see, it's, when, when it's red, it means the experimental group babies have more of this connectivity. And you see, this is my favorite one, of course, left frontal to a large region uh, in the back of the brain. That was the first study we could also do MRI with Simon Warfield support. And what you see here is uh, individual infant pictures. This is uh, now two weeks after due date. This is corpus callosum. There are some fiber tracks, these little red lines, and the black lines are fiber tracks that go perpendicularly to the slide, while the red ones go 
in the, in the image. Here you see an experimental group child. I don't have to show you this for very long that you say, I want this baby to go home with me. Much more well-developed frontal lobe fiber tracks, the red lines compared to these frontal red lines, and more well-organized, lumped together, if you will, fiber tracks in the uh, internal capsule. MDI, here it is, at nine months, significantly better performance, MDI, PDI, and the Bailey behavior rating scale that looks at the modulation beyond the task accomplishment. Now at age eight, with Gloria McAnulty's, our collaborators, uh, help, she's a neuropsychologist, she said, let's try this executive function, integrative measure, the Ray Astery's complex figure test. And what this test asks, for those of you not familiar with it, it's a black and white line drawing. This rectangle is the core gestalt. There are di diagonals that dissect it, and a vertical and a horizontal line. Then there is a triangle at the front of the rectangle. And there are various other details. The interesting thing, as you will see, this face-like detail is preserved by even the most poorly organized child. So what do you do? You show this drawing to the child, you leave it in front of the child, and say, copy it the best you can. And then you collect the, babe, the child's uh, drawing, praising him, of course. And then you give him another blank piece of paper and say, now draw it without the model in front of you. Do the best you can. And you collect it again. And children say, you didn't tell me I had to do it again. OK, well, now you did it. Then you do testing of verbal tests for some 20 minutes. And you give the child another third page and say, remember that drawing you did? Do the best you can in reproducing it, draw it again. Then they get really upset. No one told me I had to remember it this long. You know. What we see is, this is an experimental group child from this low-risk AGA study. This is a pretty good copy. It's probably as good as, certainly as good as I can do it. You look at this child. The child doesn't quite get the basic configuration. It's more of a strewing of details along the page, although there are many components. Here's the immediate recall without the model in front of you. This is pretty good. Here's the rectangle. Uh, yeah, with the triangle, the dissecting lines, the little face, and a fair number of the details. So the gestalt is embedded in short-term memory compared to this child. It's lost a lot of detail and has now made sort of a rocket ship. 20 minutes later, great retention of the basic form and of the detail. Now here's that little face. Even when nothing else stays in place, the little face is there. It's almost better than this one. So something made it into more long-term memory and is retrievable. Needless to say, the control group children did much worse. This is just individual children I showed you, but group data showed the same thing. EEG coherence, now at school age, good multiple brain region, long distance across hemisphere engagement, frontal lobe to frontal lobe, and here uh, occipital still to frontal. So quite impressive of how this restructuring, launching the brain differently carries forward into school age. This is uh, diffusion tensor imaging. 
with tractography. Here are two control group children, and here are two experimental group children. The, the denser the fiber tracks are aligned, the darker the color is, and the more light orange and yellow, the more diffusely aligned the fiber tracks are. So what is measured and imaged is mean diffusivity, which the lower the better. So these are more mature fiber tracks at school age in the experimental group compared to the control group. We then really pushed and said, can we help babies who come into the world already undergrown, IUGR babies who were below the third percentile in weight and below the third percentile in head circumference, no genetic differences, no genetic abnormalities, no smoking, no drug use. And we found, yes, for them it makes a big difference autonomically and a big difference regulation-wise. And you can already read these scans now, the denser, the tighter, bundled in the experimental group, the corticospinal tract, the MDI is significantly better. And here you see the ray osteries. Imagine if all you recall from having seen an image 20 minutes ago are these few details. What life must look like, how hard it would be to organize your day when you are continuously having to get a new map more remembrances, more verbal maps drawn by your mother or your teacher. Interestingly, the uh, cerebellar volumes of the experimental group children, right and left, were significantly higher than those, that's the red dots, than those of some of the controls, and there was the whole control group. The cerebellum, known to be involved in emotion regulation, invoked by some tentative work, I'm not so in agreement with that in autism. So interesting in these very hypersensitive babies. So we think NITCAP can support the brain by ensuring, ensuring calmness and comfort, and there was perhaps protect the NMDA axis from, you know, getting reduced toxic, toxic glutamates and free radical release, perhaps. We think NITCAP certainly supports blood flow steadiness and there was maybe has prevented some of the intraventricular hemorrhages that our studies have shown. The intimate contact with the parents in skin to skin, we certainly think helps release more oxytocin, which helps the child's social and emotional development. And perhaps supporting darkness increases melatonin uh, and helps with enhanced sleep and cognitive development. Sari Ferber, a collaborator in Israel, is studying this whole hormonal household and what it does in terms of prematurity. It takes a team in a unit to organize this care. It has to be your own team. It can't be imported visitors. So you are here very fortunate. You have your well-trained NITCAP professionals on board, on staff, that can help you as physicians, as nurses, as therapists, to stay aware of what the baby says, even in complex procedures that you have to give. Together with Deborah Bueller, we formulated this NITCAP nursery opportunity. How do you get to a steady state in developmental care implementation rather than the variability from staff to staff? You have to first assess yourself as unit. What are your strengths? Where can you, from what can you build? What are your complexities, your opportunities for change? Start with your strengths, 
and from there identify the next steps, make a plan, divide it into tasks, get teams to, to help with the individual task uh, solutions, and then reassess. You always need to reflect, what are we doing? Where did we fail? How do we move forward? What comes back to us? How do we maintain this openness without getting discouraged? And you will get discouraged by a new architectural design, by new leadership, by new management, you name it, we all have been there. And you need to keep moving forward because these babies will tell you, I count on you, I trust that you will do well by me. So giving all newborns a voice is what it's all about. Think of all the newborns out in the world and how much work you have to do. And I trust you are well launched to do this work. The only limit to our realization of tomorrow will be our doubts of today. Move forward with strong and active conviction. Thank you very much. Thank you.